For years, research has come out linking your gut bacteria to everything from brain health to autoimmune disease. But how do you really know that it's healthy? Well, on today's episode, I'm going to tell you exactly how you do that. First thing you have to be able to do is have a test for it. We have to have a way to identify the different microflora, the good bacteria, the bad bacteria, um, things like yeast and parasites, different microbes that can exist in those guts. We have to have a reliable way to look at that environment. The Neurotrition Podcast is sponsored by North Florida Spine and Wellness and produced by Juming Delmas Studios. Welcome back to another episode of the Neurotrition Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Z, and today's episode is going to be all about your microbiome. For years, research has come out linking your gut bacteria to everything from brain health to autoimmune disease. But how do you really know that it's healthy? Well, on today's episode, I'm going to tell you exactly how you do that. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us at Neurotrition Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. And drop us a comment if you'd like us to cover a specific topic on the show. Now, hey, let's talk about your gut. Okay, in order to really tell if your microbiome is healthy, the first thing you have to be able to do is have a test for it. We have to have a way to identify the different microflora, the good bacteria, the bad bacteria, um, things like yeast and parasites, different microbes that can exist in those guts. We have to have a reliable way to look at that environment. And so the best way I have seen to do that and most uh, effective way to do that comprehensively is through something called GI map testing. GI map testing uses PCR technology. So this is detecting the DNA strands of different bacteria, fungus, yeast, uh, bac- uh, parasites, all of those things make it a very sensitive test to see if there is possible um, microbials that are disrupting our diversity of our gut flora. What's also great about this test is it doesn't stop there. It can also give us information on uh, digestive function. It's going to give us uh, information on digestive enzymes, for instance. It's going to look at markers for our gut lining, so to see if we have that quote-unquote leaky gut that a lot of people like to talk about, and we'll give some context to that as well, but also can tell us if there's inflammatory markers that might mean this is more of an autoimmune disease, maybe like an ulcerative colitis or a Crohn's disease, um, other disorders of that nature. So this is such a comprehensive test. I think it makes so much sense to to use this if even if you were trying to if even if you don't have um, digestive symptoms but simply want to know if your uh, gut is healthy as possible because we know that this has been linked to everything to uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, um, even depression has connections to different uh, microflora in our gut. You know, most of our neurotransmitters, about 80%, 90% of our neurotransmitters, especially of our serotonin, is actually made in your digestive tract. So this is a very important system. And I think it's very important that if we're going to take a proactive uh, step towards our health, that we look and test at this. So let's dive into what a GI map test will look like. So when we look at a GI map report, the first page we're going to see is looking at really what I would like to call more acute infection. So these are the things that you would probably um, look at more as like an acute food poisoning, for instance. This is typically going to cause more uh, severe um, GI symptoms in the short term. So things like diarrhea or vomiting, um, different things like that. So these are things that typically I, I actually don't see because usually when people get these types of infections, either, either they run their course or um, people go to the doctor, get antibiotics or something, uh, some sort of their treatment like that because they are so sick in the short term. You know, usually when people come to see me, it's more for chronic issues um, that have not gone away with traditional medical type of intervention. So um, the big one uh, that you actually see present here um, And when we see these tests uh, on this section, we're going to look hopefully to see less than DL. What does that mean? Below the detectable limit. That means they couldn't find essentially a shred of DNA um, to see any uh, evidence of any of these microbes. So 
in this section, that is what we're looking for. When we go into future sections, you're going to see that there is a normal amount of certain bacteria for there to for that to be in the gut normally. So in this case, we see that uh, C. diff is a very common um, bacterium that we will see uh, people get infected with. This is commonly after antibiotic use is when people get infected with this will cause severe diarrhea typically. Um, and 2 to 10% approximately of the population can be a carrier for this. So um, the nice thing about this is treatment is oftentimes just high dose probiotics. So it's you know something that's relatively easy to treat. Sometimes we can use um, certain herbals as well uh, to help control this. Uh, but this is more of um, something that, believe it or not, does come up when, when people have chronic issues. But in uh, for most people, we will see negatives along this, but still a good thing to know because um, some of these infections can become chronic. The next section is going to touch on a couple of different things. One is H. pylori. I would like to talk a little bit about H. pylori for just a minute. This is something that has been in the news and generally um, a lot of people have been aware of this bacteria in general for causes of things like ulcers and even stomach cancer. Um, and it oftentimes has been something that has been treated for um, acid reflux type symptoms. Here's the thing, uh, the treatment model on this has kind of evolved over time because what we have found is H. pylori is often there in certain levels that are considered normal and not necessarily problematic to the patient. And what I love about this test is it doesn't just look at how much H. pylori is there, but also something called virulence factors. What does that mean? Virulence factors are essentially a marker to know is this strand of H. pylori more likely to cause some sort of pathology, something like an ulcer, something like a stomach cancer, which is actually really rare um, from H. pylori, but still something that can happen, or maybe even some acid reflux. So just because we have some positive H. pylori, um, sometimes it's not detectable to level where we would even consider it uh, to create a problem. And then other times it's it is high, um, but perhaps there's no symptoms uh, that the patient's having relating to that or doesn't have any virulence factors. So oftentimes we're just going to leave that alone. We might want to balance out, um, we're still going to balance out the gut and the microbiome in general, and we may see a change in that number of H. pylori um, from that perspective. But this is not something we want to chase with treatment all the time. The next section is going to go into our good bacteria. These are the bacteria that we want to see. And you see, when we're looking at this, it has a series of different strains. Some of these strains you can get commercially in different probiotics. Some you can't. Um, but it does give you a nice range of, hey, are these on the low end compared to the general population? Or are these on the higher end? And we're going to see as we go through this test that you can actually get too much of certain probiotics. There can be an overgrowth or a problematic feature of, of good bacteria. And so that's why I always caution people, you know, a lot of us think that we should be taking probiotics just to take probiotics. And, you know, for a lot of people, I'm not saying that's necessarily always a bad thing, but it is good to know the status of your microbiome because there is a possibility. And we'll talk more as we get into prebiotics. And there's another very hot topic that that sometimes can create an issue as well if you don't know what is happening. And I oftentimes uh, see people who will take a prebiotic and actually their symptoms or their GI symptoms will get worse. And we're going to tie into why that is. Okay, the next section of the GI map is going to be, like I already alluded to, some of the dysbiotic that's in balance, essentially, or overgrowth of certain bacteria that we can have in our gut. And going back into what we were talking about with prebiotics, prebiotics, essentially, if you think about them in a simple terms, are essentially pre are essentially fertilizers for your gut bacteria. So this sounds good on its face, right? If you, for instance, are planting a garden or wanting to have a nice lawn, you you typically put some sort of fertilizer to help um, to help those plants grow. However, what we have to realize is prebiotics are indiscriminate fertilizers. So they are going to fertilize not only the bacteria that need to come up perhaps, but they also can feed all the bacteria and create overgrowth and create symptoms. So um, the first section of uh, microbes we see here, things like Bacillus, uh, Enterococcus, these are um, bacteria that can be even seen as probiotics, but 
if they get overgrown, they can create something called SIBO, which stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which essentially can cause everything from uh, bloating, um, acid reflux, um, a lot of GI discomfort. So th- what's important is this is all about balance. That's kind of a theme when we talk about most things on this show is that we have to create some form of balance. Um, Morganella is actually another interesting bacteria that when it gets overgrown, believe it or not, it can create uh, histamine. Histamine can be released um, from this uh, type of microbe, which a lot of people actually have, a lot of people don't think about this, but there's actually histamine in foods as well. And so I have had patients who um, don't necessarily have allergies, but they will oftentimes break out in hives because their bodies do not process that histamine. So that can be somewhat in your genetics, but also if you have imbalance in your gut flora and overgrowth of certain bacteria like this one, then that also can be a source of those types of symptoms. Um, staph and strep bacteria, believe it or not, these are very commonly found in your gut. Um, most Probably one of the most frequently um, gut microbe that we see, and it is not uncommon um, for this to be a little bit overgrown. So this does not mean these are always going to create symptoms, but certainly when we see lots of overgrowth here, not only are we not going to want to do a lot of pro and prebiotics at this point, and we're going to talk about what treatment looks like um, when we start to try to deal with some of these imbalances, but we need to make sure that we're um, killing this stuff off, bringing kind of... um, pruning back some of the amounts of these bacteria before we go into other stages of probiotics, replacement, um, healing uh, the gut lining. So um, these are very important to, to think about that. You know, again, just throwing in probiotics into the mix is not always going to be a positive, uh, a net positive. So it's really important to me when we look at treating the gut, as I alluded to earlier, that it's we're just not focused on killing the bad microbes, doing the parasite cleanse or the uh, candida cleanse, um, not just focused on killing the microbes that we see come up in our GI map test. We have to go through a more complete process that is often referred to as the five R's. That is remove, replace, re-inoculate, repair, and then rebalance. So basically in that first stage, we are going to be removing. This is where Um, We are going to get rid of those parasites. Um, We're going to deal with that bacterial overgrowth. Uh, Maybe we have to get rid of some candida or even some viruses to help the first stage of balancing out that uh, microbiota. And we do this with things that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think we would typically use like antibiotics. Sometimes we do have to use antibiotics to kill um, stubborn bacteria. However, um, a lot of times we can use natural herbals like berberine containing herbs, uh, caprylic acid, oregano oil, uh, things like wormwood in our medicine uh, can be very helpful uh, to kill parasites. So it can be a variety of different products and compounds, and oftentimes we will stack and layer these compounds together to make sure we're getting a broad spectrum of these antimicrobial uh, properties to get a... um, a host of different microbes. And when we do this, we're going to do it over a relatively short period of time. Uh, Oftentimes, I would say we're going to be in this stage for maybe six to eight weeks at the most. And as we're doing that, um, and it's going to depend on each case, of course, but we'll usually start this pretty quickly. We're going to remove, we're going to start adding phase two, which is replacing. And so this is uh, typically when we're talking about digestive enzymes, uh, maybe we need uh, more stomach acid. So that's where things like apple cider vinegar can be very helpful, herbal bitters. Uh, maybe we need to add some bile support to help the gallbladder run more efficiently. Or maybe you don't have a gallbladder and we have to add some bile salts to help digest fats. So that's something that we'll often do uh, pretty early on as well. And then we're going to go into the next stage, which is re-inoculate, um, which is where we are going to start thinking about the things people are probably most familiar with when it comes to gut health, and that's prebiotics and probiotics. And I almost never do this in the beginning because, um, as we've already kind of mentioned, if you have an imbalance and you're throwing more bacteria in there, especially if it's a bacterial overgrowth, 
then that's oftentimes going to be uh, counterproductive, especially with prebiotics. Remember, prebiotics are fertilizers to bacteria, and it doesn't care if it's a good bacteria or a bad bacteria. It's going to help uh, support the production of both of those things. So this is typically something we're going to start later in the process, but oftentimes we will do this for a longer period of time. And then we go into probably the most important stage, and that's repair. Repair is when we're going to heal that gut lining. You have to remember that in order to keep the flora balanced, the gut lining has to be healthy. And especially with people who are dealing with chronic stress, maybe emotional trauma, and maybe we're dealing with uh, children who have an immature gut lining because their nervous system's immature. The gut lining, believe it or not, that hyperpermeability or leaky gut that we refer to, we're all born with that. Our GI tract is born immature and it has to develop. And that's part of the development of our uh, parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve, um, creating that gut brain network that generally happens through that first year of life. A lot of times, especially in autism, I think this is why GI work in kids and autism is so very important, is that we're going to have naturally have that kind of leaky gut, if we want to use that term again, um, because of that immaturity of the nervous system. So in these cases, doing things like vagus nerve stimulation um, is oftentimes very, very helpful because like I've mentioned on uh, several uh, prior occasions on the show, that the uh, gut brain axis is a bi-directional, a two-way street, and it takes input from not only the bottom up from our microbiota, but also from the top down through that vagus nerve. So this is another um, really important tool because the vagus nerve will actually wire right into that gut lining. And so this is something that uh, becomes a, a very cool uh, tool um, that we have to think about using quite often. Other things we can use to repair the gut lining um, are things like L-glutamine. Um, there's even ionized minerals that we often use that will help um, heal those uh, GI cells as well. And what's really cool is oftentimes we will see people with lots of food sensitivities, um, as we start to heal, heal that gut lining, we'll see those uh, sensitivities start to decrease. And oftentimes, uh, many of them actually go away completely. You know, a lot of people who come into us with GI issues or maybe with just inflammatory or autoimmune issues, they will say, I, you know, I, I react to a bunch of different foods. Um, I can barely have a very limited uh, amount of, you know, group of foods that I can eat. And that automatically makes you think, you know, this is not really normal to be that reactive. If your immune system is that reactive to that many types of foods, there's probably something else going on. And one of the things that we very commonly see in those types of patients is this hyperpermeability of the gut lining. And so, again, we're not going to be able to um, really stabilize anything without um, completing this very, very important stage. And that brings us into the, the final uh, R, and that's rebalance, which essentially is the lifestyle correction, making sure that we're eating healthy, making sure that we are sleeping well, that we're uh, managing stress um, as much as possible. Because if we just go back to eating processed foods and not getting uh, very much sleep and not dealing with all of those different um, factors, both physical and emotional, that put us in this place to begin with, then we're not going to have we're going to have to do this whole thing all over again. Um, so there is more. This is more of keeping the improvement. This um, rebalance area, but I think it's really really important because we have to deal with that and acknowledge that. Otherwise, you know, we're going to keep fighting this same battle uh, over and over and over again. So that is essentially how you can look at your gut health, how you can improve your gut health, and how you know that your microbiome is healthy to give you the best chance of a very fruitful and longevity filled life. This is a such a great way to do this, you know, as opposed to just throwing some probiotics up against the wall and hoping you're um, optimizing that that microbiome. So if this is something that you'd like to have done or interested in doing, this is a test that we do in the office every single day. So check out our website. I'll put it in the show notes. It's healthytallahassee.com. And that's going to be all for this episode of the Neurotrition Podcast. So don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok at Neurotrition Podcast. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode.
And you know what? Don't forget to drop a comment and let us know if there's a topic you'd like to have us cover in a future episode. See you guys next time.